Hi, my name's Lucas Young. Welcome to Right Click. Each week on the show, we're going to be showing you how to get the most out of your PC and the Windows operating system. Now, we'll start with the basics. We'll build up your skill level until you too become a computer geek. If you're already a computer geek, the advanced section of the show is for you. We also have an internet section for cyber geeks and a section we like to call Tech Toys where we cover what's cool, what's new in the world of computer accessories. Now any computer show worth its salt has a website and if our skilled team of post-production professionals have done their job right, that's what you'll be seeing on screen at the moment. We also have an email address where you can send us your comments, your views, what you think of the show and so on. This week I'm going to cover the basics of the PC, what makes it up, what's RAM and CPU and ROM and that sort of thing. What do these words mean? How do I use these words at a party to impress my friends? With that said, let's get started. Most modern computers, regardless of the cost, contain the same basic components. Knowing a little bit about what these components are and how they interact can be really helpful in diagnosing problems with your computer, or even if you just want to go into a PC store and buy a new machine. Let's take a look at some of these components. The foundation upon which your computer is based is a piece of circuitry known as the motherboard or the main board. This sits inside your computer's case and the other components of your computer plug or slot into this board. The CPU, the RAM, expansion cards and so on. Normally you don't hold a computer component like this without being grounded, but today I have special dispensation from the gods of static just for the show. This device is called the CPU, or the Central Processing Unit. It's the heart, it's the soul of your computer system. It works by adding and subtracting numbers at a very high speed. So fast, in fact, that it needs a big grunty fan like this just to keep it cool. CPUs are rated by their speed, or the number of calculations a second they can perform. If you imagine a watch ticking once a second, that's a speed rating of 1 Hz. A modern CPU operates at 500 megahertz, that's 500 million calculations a second. And the newer CPUs operate at 1 gigahertz, that's 1000 million operations a second, and that's fast. When you're buying a computer, the speed of your CPU is your primary consideration. The CPU is like the Pied Piper, it plays the tune, the other components in your system just follow along. If the CPU is the brain of your computer, then RAM is its memory. RAM is fast. CPU uses it for storing programs and data and so on while it's working. And when you turn your computer off, the information in the RAM is lost. Now RAM stands for Random Access Memory. What this means is that the computer can access the information in RAM pretty much instantaneously. Much the same way, for example, that a CD player can access music on a CD-ROM instantaneously. You press track 6, the player goes directly to track 6. The smallest piece of information that a computer can store is called a bit. A 1 or a 0, a true or a false, a yes or no, it's a sort of on-off sort of a value and four bits make up a nibble. There are two nibbles in a byte. A byte of information is the amount of storage it takes to store, say, a character of text. Now, computers don't count the same way people do, so a kilobyte of memory is not a thousand bytes. It's actually a thousand and twenty-four. That can be pretty confusing, but it's a pretty impressive figure to bandy around at parties. So 1,024 bytes is a kilobyte, and a kilobyte is the amount of storage it would take to hold, say, a page of text. 1,024 kilobytes is called a megabyte. A megabyte is the amount of storage it takes to store, for example, an entire book like this. So a megabyte of memory could store the text in a book like this. This is a 64 meg RAM chip. That means it can hold the equivalent of 64 of these books all on a little chip like this. Pretty amazing. When you buy a new computer, you can expect to get anywhere between 32 and 64 megs of RAM with it, and of course most computers can be upgraded. Mm -hmm. 
I hope you're all still with me because there's more techno babble on the way. When you need a more permanent storage solution than RAM, that's where the hard drive comes in, the hard disk drive. Hard drives store files, programs and data on a more permanent basis than RAM does. You can have more than one hard drive in your computer, and the capacity of hard drives far exceeds that of RAM. It's still measured in bytes, but we're not talking megabytes anymore, we're talking gigabytes. That's thousands of megabytes of data. A modern hard drive you'd buy in the shop might hold anywhere between 6 and 10 gigabytes of data. That's, for example, 6,000 books this size, all stored in a little metal box like that. That's a lot of data. A good hard drive will last you 3 to 5 years. Unfortunately, when a hard drive dies, it often dies completely, taking all your data with it. So it's a good idea to have a regular backup plan in place for keeping your data safe. Hard disk drives and RAM are great storage devices, but how does the user get data into them? Using a screwdriver is not standard operating procedure and tends not to work very well. Most computers come with a type of drive called a floppy disk drive. Floppy disk drives take, not surprisingly, floppy disks. And this is a floppy disk. It doesn't look floppy, but it does actually have a floppy disk inside it. Floppy disks are used for storing information, transferring information from your computer to another computer, or backing up the data on your computer. Now, floppy disks are old technology. They only hold 1400 odd KB of data. Roughly the amount of data, again, in this book. 1.4 megabytes. And unfortunately, they're a very common method of transmitting viruses between computers. I'll talk about viruses and antivirus software later in the series. A more modern method of storing data is the CD-ROM. Most new computers come with a CD-ROM drive like this. A CD-ROM drive can read music CDs as well as data CDs. In fact, most new software comes on data CD-ROMs. A CD-ROM can hold around 650 megabytes of data. Again, using my trusty book, that's the information in about 650 of these. It's important if you're using a CD-ROM in a CD-ROM drive, you keep the CD-ROM clean and you don't get fingerprints on it. Modern computers unfortunately are not telepathic, although I imagine there's a telepathic version in the works. So in the meantime, we need to communicate with them in a conventional manner. This is a keyboard. It's very much like a standard typewriter keyboard. It's got the same QWERTY keys, an enter key, a spacebar, and so on. A lot of people get nervous around computer keyboards because they have a whole lot of extra keys here. But most of these are only used in special circumstances. Now, using a computer keyboard for a long period of time can lead to wrist strain and RSI. So for information on using a computer with the correct posture, see your local computer dealer. One of the greatest revolutions in the history of computers has been the invention of the mouse. The mouse is a pointing device. You slide it around on a flat surface such as a table or a mouse pad and it controls a pointer on the screen of your computer. You use this pointer to then control the programs your computer is running. Most mice come with two buttons, a left button and a right button. Over time, a mouse can become difficult and frustrating to use because it picks up dust from the surfaces that you're rolling it over. It's important to keep your table or your mouse pad clean and free of dust. Cleaning your mouse. Make sure your computer is switched off. Turn your mouse over. Remove the circular cover above your mouse ball by twisting it in the anti-clockwise direction. Tip the cover and the mouse ball out. Looking into the mouse cavity, you should see two or three rollers. These rollers may have a ring of dust around them. Using a flat blade, scrape the ring of dust off the rollers and blow it or vacuum it out of the mouse. Replace the ball and the cover.
In order for your computer to communicate with the outside world, it sometimes needs some extra cards plugged into the motherboard, circuit boards like this. These are sometimes called PCI cards or AGP cards. Examples of common cards are display adapters which are used to control your monitor, sound cards which control your speakers, or modems which your computer uses to connect to the internet. The beauty of cards like these is that you can take them out and replace them with newer and better versions. Well that's the end of our look at the components that make up a PC. I hope you've got a better idea now as to what's going on inside that box and I hope you're feeling a bit more confident about walking into a computer store to buy a new computer or upgrade an existing one. Next week in the basic section of the show we're going to be talking about buying a computer, how to plug one in and set it up, how to turn the thing on. This week on the advanced section of the show, I want to talk about correctly uninstalling software. Many people make the mistake when they're uninstalling software of simply finding the application's folder, often in the program files directory, highlighting it and deleting it. More often than not, this does not uninstall the application properly. When Windows software is installed, files are often copied to many different places on your hard drive, registry entries are created, start menu items are created, win INI entries are created and so on. So it's important when you remove a piece of software that you follow the correct procedure to ensure that all the correct files and settings are removed from your computer and your computer will then operate correctly. The first thing you should do when you're uninstalling software is go to the Start menu, Programs, find the entry for your particular piece of software and see if it has an uninstall option. Most good software comes with an uninstall feature. Failing that, try going to the Control Panel. From within the Control Panel, open the Add Remove Programs applet and see if your program is listed there. If it is, you should be able to remove it using this feature. If all else fails, then maybe you can delete the application folder from your program files directory. Often, even after you've run a correct uninstall procedure, the application folder still remains in your program files directory. That's often because data that you've created while you've had the software installed still remains in that folder and isn't removed by the uninstall process. So once you've run the uninstall and the software has been removed from your system, it's then okay to go into the program files directory or wherever the app Star Trek Armada is the latest game from Activision. It plays a little bit like Warcraft in space, in that you have to build star bases, mine dilithium, manufacture starships and probes and so on. Captain's Log, Stardate 53550.8 With the Dominion Now the game is set after the end of hostilities between the Dominion and the Federation. The new threat to the Federation is from the Borg. And if you remember the Borg from the TV series, they were the dudes that flew around in big Rubik's Cubes. However, in Star Trek Armada, they seem to fly around in big green blobby things. I'm not quite sure why. All sections on standby. The sound and graphics in this game are fairly cool, and it has the usual cut scenes involving Captain Picard. Course of action. I did find the interface was quite clunky, and selecting ships quite awkward. However, for a Star Trek game, it's not bad at all, and I rate it 8 out of 10. In this week's internet section I'd like to talk about ISPs or internet service providers. You need an account with an ISP before you can connect to the internet. The same way you need an account with telecom before you can use your telephone. ISPs come in different sizes and flavours. Some ISPs even offer free accounts such as i for free and z free. If you're considering signing up with either of these ISPs make sure you read their fine print first. 
Most ISPs offer two different types of payment schemes. There's the flat rate scheme where you pay monthly and you can stay on the internet as long as you like. This normally costs you around $35 a month. Or you can pay by the hour at around $2 to $5 an hour. Personally, I prefer the pay by the month plan. It means you can stay on the net as long as you like. In order to connect to the internet, your computer has to have a circuit board installed called a modem. Modems come in different speeds. The top speed modem you can get is a 56K. So if you're going into a computer store to buy a modem, try and get a modem that's a speed of 56K. You get an extra cable which plugs into your modem and into the phone socket in your wall. If you are intending to be on the internet a lot, it's a good idea to invest in a second phone line. This week's website of the week is Google, www.google.com. Google is an excellent search engine. You're able to add the Google search engine button to your browser's toolbar simply by dragging and dropping. Clicking the Google button brings up the Google search box. Google is one of our favourite search engines, followed closely by InfoSeq at infoseq.go.com. Remember when you're using a search engine to phrase your queries correctly. Keep them brief and detailed and specific. If your queries are too specific, you won't get any results back. If your queries are too general, you'll get far too many results. So learning to use a search engine effectively is a matter of learning to formulate your queries in a manner that gives you the results you want. Hi everybody and welcome to Tech Toys. Each week I'll be showing you some new toys and gadgets you can use with your PC, either to improve productivity or maybe just for fun. Now this week's toy definitely goes in the fun basket. It's one of the latest products from the well-known brand Lego, the Lego Mindstorm range. Now you might be thinking, what do Lego and PCs have in common? Well the answer is one of the major selling points of this product. Lego Mindstorms allows you to build moving, interactive robots and then give them artificial intelligence with your PC. Watch as I build a rover and then bring it to life. The kit comes with two motors, two touch sensors and a light sensor to help the robot interact with its environment. The brain of the robotics invention system is this little unit here, the RCX. 32 kilobytes of raw power and can hold up to five different programs you write yourself. Once the rover is built, we need to program it using the very intuitive and simple software, Lego Robotics Factory. Once our code is created, we need to transfer it to our LEGO robot. LEGO have made this incredibly easy. All you need to do is sit your RCX in front of this infrared transmitter, click download, and voila, it's done. Ah, this is what I like to see. Now if only I could get it to clean the studio. The robotics invention system is rated for ages 12 and up. But hey, I'm a few years beyond 12 and I'm hooked. It's the flagship of the LEGO Mindstorm range of toys which also include Star Wars droids and scout kits. For more information on this great product, visit their website and online community. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Well, that's the end of our first show. We hope you enjoyed it and you learned something. If you'd like to get hold of us, 
feel free to email us on the address below with any comments or suggestions. Next week on the show I'm going to be covering buying a PC, setting one up and pushing that power button. Music